Here we go. Hello out there. We're on the air. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Daily Bitcoin Journey. Actionable and logical discussion for Bitcoiners and for future Bitcoiners. Another Q&A. It is Thursday. It's good to see everybody live, YouTube, Rumble, and the folks listening later. Happy Thursday. Johnny's in the house. Letha in the house. Fresh onto Noster with a with the zap feature set up. Good on you, Letha. Crypto Heathen. Well, it is Thursday. It is our favorite day of the week. I think we missed it last week. Maybe not. Anyways, we got some really good questions here this morning. So I got a I got a list of about every Thursday we do a live Q and A on the show. People send in questions via email or comments on YouTube or however Noster. I don't know. Anyways, I get a few good ones today. But also, if you're in the live chat and you have any questions about anything Bitcoin related, uh, anything else, business stuff, we've been talking about on here. I apologize if you can hear Arnie in the background. He's kind of whining right now. But he'll get over it. So that's what we're going to be going through today. We'll start with the metrics, though. Like we always do. Rock and roll. Good morning, wonderful Bitcoin. Purchasing power to the people. Hashtag Bitcoin. Do hashtags work on YouTube? Comments? I don't know. People like throwing out the hashtags. Oh, yeah, my email up there. We don't need to be showing that to the world. Okay, let's get to the metrics. Here's the mempool. We're currently block height 833580. So since January 3rd, 2009, 833,000 blocks have been mined. Each Bitcoin block is just full of a bunch of transactions. That's all that it is. And the miner responsible for putting together that block, compiles all the transactions, collects all the fees, and broadcasts it out to the entire Bitcoin network. So this is the block height right here, 83350. It was mined by Luxor. I don't think I've ever seen that one before. A couple new ones in there. I really like this new feature on Mempool, where it shows who mined the last block. I like that. Uh, where were we here? So the... Looks like they got 6.3 low fees this morning. They only got 0.1 of a Bitcoin. Still pretty good though. 10 million sats. And uh, fees are low this morning. 12 sats per V-byte. That's interesting. It's kind of been all over the map in the last couple of days. It's 80 yesterday, 12 today. So if you need to send any Bitcoin on layer one, today's the day. Check in quickly with Clark Moody dashboard just as a... Uh, additional resource for people if you're interested if you're a nerd like myself you have pretty much everything you need to know about bitcoin on this thing bitcoin.clarkmoody.com slash dashboard so but our own metrics this is the bitcoin journey dashboard here sorry arnie's still whining i don't know if you can hear it or not but so today, the price, 66680 US dollars. Last year, this time, price was $22,218. And four years ago today, March 7, 2020, this was right around the time when the world shut down. I think it was like March 12th, 12th, 12th or 13th. That's where the basketball player touched, touched the mic and got COVID and then everything was canceled after that. That was four years ago. Price of Bitcoin at that time was 8,195 US dollars. Moscow time today, one US dollar will get you 1,500 sats on the dot. Here in Canada, we have breached 90,000 once again. Price in Canada, 90,017 Canadian dollars. Moose jaw time, which is the equivalent of Moscow time here in Canada, one Canadian dollar, one loonie will get you 1,107 
Sats. Letha says, well, you shared the link to your interview. I saw several Bitcoin news accounts on X. There, so I talked about this a couple of days ago. I was going to be on Bitcoin news. Uh, but the guy there, the CEO, I guess you'd call him, emailed me yesterday and said that we're not going to be doing that. They have a uh, YouTube strategy. They have a guy doing it right now. And I guess the guy doing it didn't want another guy doing it on the channel. So... <laughs> So that's okay. It probably worked out for the best. I really want to spend a lot of my time and energy growing this channel and, and bring the most to you guys. So that was just something I was going to do for uh, to to grow this channel as well. But it's uh, maybe maybe in the future we'll be working together. So unfortunately, no link, no interview. But that's uh, that's how she goes. Did you guys hear the uh, <laughs> Arnie there? <laughs> He said, he's out in the morning. He had a lot of energy. We had a really good sleep last night. Four year, and oh, is it today? Four year anniversary today of the lockdowns in the US. Wow, that's really hard to believe. It honestly feels like a different lifetime ago. But at the same time, oh, well, there were some really tough days there for sure for everybody. And I think probably if you're, if you're watching this channel, uh, I'm assuming that you're probably one of the people who are more affected than others in terms of your views, your <laughs> common sense and logic that was severely lacking during that time. So anyways, we made it through. Good morning, Justine. Happy to make today's live. Good morning. Jose, respect, respect to you too. Good for being here today. First time I think I've seen you in the chat. <laughs> yeah, that was a loud one. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's uh, let's get to some questions here. But before we do, before we do, I got to find this quote. I want to start another with another quote today. This, this show is going to be mostly focused on security. Mostly. We got a couple other things, but mostly focused on security. So let me find this quote here. I had it loaded up, but then, of course, I did something else. But I know exactly where it is. Okay, so here's today's quote. This is what we're going with. The quote is from NVK. This NVK is the CEO, I believe, the founder of CoinKite. CoinKite produces the cold card, which is the highest standard of Bitcoin security in my opinion, and, and many other opinions in Bitcoin that I trust. So if you don't have a cold card, something that I would consider. I'm not selling it. I'm not sponsored by cold card. I'm just a very satisfied customer, sleep very well at night, knowing that wherever I keep my Bitcoin has never been connected to my laptop. It's a big deal. And I, don't, I think people underestimate how big of a deal it is. So that's kind of going to be the focus today, I think. So NV, NVK's quote, this was a tweet from yesterday. It's probably on Nostra too. But he said, always secure your Bitcoin as if it was 10 times what it is worth today. So always secure your Bitcoin as if it was 10 times more valuable than it is today or, or priced higher than it is today. And I think that that's a very good, that's kind of how I've been thinking through this whole, my short time in Bitcoin. That's how I've been seeing this is like, I don't really pay attention to what it's worth right now in fiat because i know how unreliable that is to compare it to so what i'm saying is prepare yourself to be very wealthy if you're holding bitcoin today 2024 regardless of the amount you're going to be ahead of 99 percent of the people on earth assuming everything goes as we expect it to and you know, more and more every single day, I'm more convinced that that's the case. Everything that's happening, and we're not going to talk about that today. But you have to be prepared for that in terms of your security, in terms of your inheritance stuff. If something were to happen to you tomorrow or today, would your family be able to figure out how to get your Bitcoin out of your wallet? I honestly think that for most Bitcoiners, so Bitcoiners are a very small percentage of the population for one. And I think that there's also a very small percentage of Bitcoiners who have actually 
communicated this with their families properly or whoever is you know next in line to get the bitcoin if something were to happen to you so one thing i would suggest is just get a piece of paper single piece of paper if it's if it's more than a piece of paper nobody's going to be able to understand that who's not familiar with bitcoin so get a single piece of paper tell them where the information is tell them what to do and another thing i would consider in there is i would put two things on there i'd say whoever your most knowledgeable bitcoin friend is whoever that is if you don't have anybody you could use somebody like me doesn't have to be me but somebody like me and the next part is why i think that that will actually be possible because the next line you're going to put who you can contact if you need help with it and then you put another line below that saying under no circumstances should you be sharing this private key this backup phrase these 12 words with anybody so even if you contact this person don't ever give them your these 12 words they should never need access to this they can help you through it while you look at those words but in terms of the 12 words themselves the backup nobody else will ever need to see that and if they ask for that run it's kind of like when you're a kid and, and your parents teach you if somebody asks you for candy you run it's the same kind of thing if somebody's supposed to be helping you and they ask you for your your backup phrase run so just be just be clear with that on the on your one page document put where how if you need help contact this person but never ever under any circumstances in bold underlined don't ever share this backup phrase with anybody because if anybody else has this this backup phrase they now own our bitcoin so keep it simple that's my advice for inheritance planning so that's that's kind of you know when we talk about preparing for this you have to be ready for all that you have to be ready for what's coming too many people are focused on the dollar value many people who own bitcoin today are still too focused on what it's worth today this is going to be a rounding error in 10 years from now we're, we're going to look back 10 years from now and laugh that you could get bitcoin for sixty thousand dollars so very early you have to be ready for this kind of stuff though you have to be living in the future essentially with your with holding your bitcoin with earning bitcoin all that kind of stuff so with that in mind let's get to it we're gonna start with what are we gonna start with here oh i did have a couple notes let's uh maybe we'll save this for another day the, we'll save it for tomorrow but the one thing i did want to point out was that the arizona senate put in legislation or whatever you call it i'm not a, a legal expert but they've essentially shown that they're interested in holding bitcoin on their reserve the arizona senate so you think about that you think about the arizona senate that's very, one small senate out of the whole world right and even michael Saylor was talking about this the other day with corporations there's 330 million corporations on earth and if bitcoin becomes what we think it's going to become uh global currency that you hold on to protect your wealth you hold on your balance sheet in reserves 330 million corps and if you don't think that every business will be holding a portion of their reserves in bitcoin i think you need to spend a little bit more time learning what's what's happening here so that's 330 million corporations that's businesses and some of those are massive some of them are small but if you consider even half of those corporations holding bitcoin in 10 years from now some of them are going to own well I, I don't know what the price is going to be at that time but some are going to own a lot of bitcoin with big reserves and some are going to own a small amount but that's 330 million with 21 million bitcoin available corporations people countries senates <laughs> just goes to show you know how how early we really are here and that's kind of something to keep in mind here as you're preparing your bitcoin security setup you have to keep that in mind that this this thing is something that you do need to hang on to with your life because you're only going to get one shot at this thing and if you've taken the time to learn about bitcoin if you've taken 
your life's energy. Essentially, that's what we're doing with Bitcoin. We're putting everything, every value that we add to the world, we get back and we put it into Bitcoin because we want to protect that. So you want to protect that Bitcoin as much as you possibly can. Right. So that's what we're doing. Rick's in the house. Good morning, folks. Did you smash the like yet? Like smashed. <laughs> you'll, so Jose says you'll be able to buy a profitable business for approximately. Two, that's a pretty specific number. 263,232 sats. Be very interested to know how you came up with that. And what's the what's your timeline on it? But I, I do really believe that. I think that, you know, once we get to that point where every single corporation on earth has some Bitcoin, uh, just imagine how many 100,000 sats is going to be worth. And that's that's kind of why I've started to prepare for that a little bit with different wallets, naming it different things. When the when the time comes, you can actually use that Bitcoin and spend that Bitcoin on uh, on different things. If you want to buy a profitable business, if you want to buy a golf course like we're doing at 88 sats, hopefully that's a plan. Oh, he made it up. Okay. <laughs> that's even better. Uh, Rock and Roll says BlackRock just announced they will also be adding Bitcoin to their own balance sheet. <clears throat> BlackRock is also creating other companies, subsidies that are going to apply for ETFs. So BlackRock doesn't just want their own ETF anymore. That's not good enough for them. They're going to be holding Bitcoin on their balance sheet and they're opening up subsidy corporations that are going to apply for Bitcoin ETFs so they can hold ETFs as well. Honestly, this, this stuff isn't very complex in terms of how many people are going to need Bitcoin versus how many Bitcoin are available. It's, it's really simple when you think about it that way. And I think that a lot of people are maybe underestimating how just how scarce Bitcoin is and just how many people and businesses and senates and nonprofits are going to be buying Bitcoin. So there you have it. So the first question here, start with an easy one. This is from Ryan Bailey Boxing. We should give a shout out to him. He comments on most videos. I'm sure he's going to be watching this video today. So shout out to Ryan Bailey Boxing. Check out his YouTube channel. He, he's, uh, I'm assuming he owns a boxing company or a boxing instruction business. So check him out, Ryan Bailey Boxing. He wants to know thoughts on the trust wallet. And I believe that that's a Coinbase wallet, right? I do have the trust wallet. I have a few... Cryptos, we'll call them, that only are compatible with trust. I bought them four years ago, haven't sold them, haven't bought any more of them, but they're sitting on there. One thing I will say about trust and Coinbase is I definitely do not trust them at all. I think that if you're either buying Bitcoin at Coinbase or you're holding your cryptos Bitcoin on your trust wallet, I would, if you have any other options, I would look at storing it somewhere else. That's just me. I have about 0% trust in Coinbase. It, there's just too much there, too much for me. And I don't, it doesn't resonate with me at all, Coinbase and everything that's happening with the ETFs, with what they've been doing with the SEC in the, in the States. I would just, if possible, use a different wallet. And, and one thing to keep in mind there, if you are using a trust wallet or an Exodus wallet because you have cryptos as well, make sure that you separate your Bitcoin from that wallet. You can hold those can have a Exodus wallet if you want to, if that's your thing, if you like gambling. But make sure that you have your Bitcoin separate, completely separate from that wallet. And it's in a Bitcoin only wallet. Like the cold card. That would be, that's my advice on there. Yep. My thoughts exactly. I don't want my wallet to be distracted by other tokens. That's a great way to put it. Only feel safe if there are 100% focused on Bitcoin. And I've had people kind of argue that before saying that it doesn't really matter. There's different elements to it. The technical side of stuff, I don't even give a shit about. I don't care. If you're if you're focused on 100% Bitcoin, you're going to have a much better wallet than somebody who's not 100% focused on Bitcoin. It's just logic. It's the same as anything. 
same as anything so that's uh that's a good comment and i appreciate that so let's start with we got a couple questions here let me open it up and hopefully this won't open up on the thing no so this is a bit of a scenario we're going to start with this one because for some people this might be a little bit above your head it's a little bit above my head i think just because this is something that i don't think that i really need to know but the more you can understand everything the, the better off you're going to be in terms of navigating this so bear with me here <laughs> one thing i've done to further my bitcoin knowledge every day is is listen to stuff that i don't uh oops i don't um fully understand and sometimes it puts me to sleep sometimes i zone out but just by listening to things you're you're gonna secondhand absorb some of this stuff and then down the road some of the dots that might not have been connected are going to now be connected so that's kind of my logic on it arizona renaissance man he says like a cardiologist compared to a general practitioner doctor talking about the bitcoin wallets it's a good analogy if you're focused on something you're probably going to be better on at it than somebody who isn't focused on it in bitcoin wallets in life in healthcare holy this i need to mute this how do i mute a group chat well good news is arnie's not howling anymore he must be snoozing so here's the question number one this is first of all great uh great opener in this email it says i hope all is well in freezing manitoba i'm surprised true true dodo <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. I'm surprised True Dodo hasn't renamed it People Toba. <laughs> oh, it's funny, but it's horrifying at the same time. Okay, so he's got three questions here. We're going to go through these. Uh, some, we'll see what we can do with it. So the first question is, if you're using Sparrow Wallet, which is the best wallet out there, if you have a choice, get a laptop, get Sparrow, get a cold card and sync those two up. So if you're using the Sparrow wallet and piggybacking off of one of somebody else's nodes, so when you get a Sparrow wallet, you're automatically connected to somebody else's node. And that's kind of who you're relying on that the information on your interface is accurate. So he says, my understanding is that your privacy is the drawback. Yes, because they can essentially see all of your transactions. You're piggybacking off of their node so i guess just to, to stop there with the mempool every time a new block is confirmed in there that gets broadcast to every single person running a node so when you see your sparrow wallet it's connected to somebody's node that's their copy of the miner they broadcast the most recent transaction or the recent block it gets added to the blockchain and that's what you're seeing there is somebody else's copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. And so it shows your balance within the blockchain on there. I'm assuming that only matters if someone knows you own the addresses in the wallet. Yes. And I, I don't really know the actual implications of that in terms of how somebody could connect your name. I guess if you KYC yourself in an exchange, send it to a wallet, somebody running a node sees that address. I think it's a little bit more than people really need to worry about at this stage, but definitely the more private you can be with Bitcoin, the better it's going to be. So he says, from what I've researched, the consensus is that the best practice for Bitcoin nodes is as follows. Number one, spare a wallet node. You're essentially piggybacking off of somebody else for amounts one to $10,000 worth of Bitcoin. I don't know if that's, it must be dollars. Yeah, it is dollars. Number two, run your own Bitcoin core node. If you have $10,000 or more up to $100,000. And then number three, you run your own Electrum server. If you have more than $100,000 worth of Bitcoin. So I haven't heard that before. That's new to me. But he's essentially saying that for a small amount of Bitcoin, you can rely on somebody else's node. For a larger amount, you run your own node 
hook up to you download the BTC core software, you run your own node and hook up to that. And then if you have over 100,000, you actually run your own server, which you connect to your node. So that's a pretty good, I think that that's a pretty good threshold to use. I don't know how serious people are going to take that. It's, it's not easy stuff to do. I mean, it is, I shouldn't say it's not easy. All you have to do is have enough space on your computer and you download the Bitcoin core software and you connect it to your node. I don't think it's very hard to do. I just don't think that a lot of people need to do it, but it is something that I'm going to do. So that probably is a pretty good threshold to use. I'm not following it myself right now, but I think that's good advice. So he says, I'm currently a number one, but I'm thinking if the value of Bitcoin skyrockets, let's say 100x, I now automatically jump from category one to three without doing anything. <clears throat> so first, first comment on that is that you should never really be too fixated on any sort of threshold. So things are always changing. I think we're, we're it's going to look foolish to say that if this, then you need this at this stage when we're looking back 10 years from now, don't ever get too caught up with the uh, hard lines of this. You, you just kind of have to feel it off based on your own experience. If you're not, haven't been in Bitcoin for very long, I don't think you need to be messing around with this kind of stuff. So even if you cross, cross the threshold, you definitely don't want to skip the, the second part there. You have to learn that even if you learn it for a couple months and then move on to running your own server, I think that that's a pretty important step for people. So just because the price increases, we, we do have to be preparing as best we can at this stage, but never feel like you have to do anything just because you heard something on YouTube, right? So he says, the problem is that if I want to move any Bitcoin from Sparrow, the current node to my own node, my privacy, my privacy hasn't improved because my addresses were initially on the Sparrow node, which was public. And I do think that that makes sense. I think that if you if you go down that deep into it, that does make sense that if somebody was paying close enough attention to your your wallet, let's say you're piggybacking off somebody's node, and they, if they were really focused on wanting to see your transactions and, and follow it all, I'm sure they could. But the the odds and the chances of that actually happening, I think are pretty slim. So if you move that to your own node, from there on, you're going to be the only person seeing all your transactions, knowing that it's you. But if, I guess on the on the flip side of that is if they were following your, yeah, I don't know, kind of my interpretation of that would be, it's not something that I would worry too much about at this stage. But I also don't have enough information to really make a, a final comment on that because I haven't done it myself. And so part of these Q&As is, I learn a lot. I hope that I can kind of explain these things in, in simple terms because I'm not a very technical person myself. Um, and I am still learning. I'm, I'm learning every single day. And I definitely do not claim to be an expert on any of this stuff. But I think that just having my level of technical stuff helps understand it because I've listened to very knowledgeable people try to understand this. And they, they make a lot of assumptions that people just are 20 steps ahead of where they actually are. So I guess to conclude that, I would just focus on learning how to run a node, get it set up if you want to, and don't worry too much about the privacy stuff right now. If, if privacy is going to be a big concern for you in the future, there will be things that come up like a, a mixer or a coin join, I think that will be more effective in terms of getting rid of that. I don't think running your own node is going to be protecting you from that. So get it set up and then worry about the privacy. It's definitely not going to get rid of all your um, your transaction history and, and somebody else being able to see that. Hey, it, I don't know how to say his name. It Hakra. He's a, I'm always in the chat with him on Ben show where, when I have been says, so good morning, TJ thoughts on Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. I personally feel it's just going to be labeled a digital commodity like Bitcoin. The world seems to have made a decision that it's that BTC is Bitcoin. Okay, it's a good question. So BTC, or is it BSV, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision? I've actually been seeing a lot of stuff on my channel about this. 
and some people I used to follow on, on crypto stuff, they're talking about BSB now. And I think that this is Craig Wright's baby, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. I think that I, I, I don't know the exact specifics of it, but my, my comments on it would be, yes, the world seems to have made its decision that Bitcoin BTC is Bitcoin. Craig Wright is a fraud for sure. He, he's actually not only a fraud, but he's done so much damage to the Bitcoin community. I would never, even if, even if Bitcoin Satoshi's vision was a better version of Bitcoin, I would never run that specifically because of Craig Wright. He claims to be Satoshi. For those who aren't as familiar with Bitcoin, Craig Wright claims that he's Satoshi. And he's taken uh, dozens of people to court over this. He's exposed a ton of different uh, Bitcoin developers who were wanting to be anonymous. He brought them into legal proceedings and he's just done such damage to Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community, that I would never, you could call it anything you want. I would never support anything that he did. And I do think that this is something that every time that Bitcoin runs, there's always going to be shit following it. Because people, <laughs> people want to, they want to profit off of other people, right? And so they're going to find things that are better version of Bitcoin, the faster version of Bitcoin. All these things are going to follow. It's, it's coming. It's already here. And the best thing you can do, I think, is, is just completely tune that out. The world seems to have made its decision that Bitcoin, BTC is Bitcoin. And I think that the, the real power of Bitcoin is the network. The, big, the bigger the network, the more people are using it, the more secure it is. And there's billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure into this. And I, I was actually arguing with somebody about this on LinkedIn yesterday, like a dummy. But I said, he was, he was basically saying that, well, let's, let's start our own coin. We can copy Bitcoin, do the exact same thing. I essentially said, like, start the coin. You put in billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure, get onto the major exchanges, uh, just a, a laundry list of things that Bitcoin has done that's really made it stand out from everything else. And it, it is because it's much better. It's because people actually trust it. And that's why Bitcoin is going to fully come, fully decouple from everything else. So, I mean, could you make a little bit of money on BSV? Possibly. Is it relevant? No. It couldn't be less relevant, to be honest with you. So, Focus on Bitcoin, learn as much as you can about Bitcoin, figure out ways to earn Bitcoin and just, just stick to one thing. It's kind of like the wallets. If you start going in circles, chasing your tail, trying to find the, the next altcoin that's going up, you're just going to, you're going to hurt yourself. So focus on Bitcoin, learn as much as you can, ignore this kind of stuff and a fork of Bitcoin cash. Okay. So I would say ignore it. <laughs> it couldn't be less relevant. It's if you look at the network compared to Bitcoin versus BSV, it's like one to what a billion or something. It's irrelevant. Uh, Rock and Roll says been running an umbral node on a Pi four. Took me less than thirty minutes to set up. On their site, they have very easy step by step instructions. There you go. Umbral. Litecoin only. Speaking of all coins, Litecoin only in the house. We got a little rocket pop there. I'm late, but good morning. So back to the questions here. Ignore BSV. It's just noise. Uh, so that's number two. So th this second one here, if somebody sees a list of my public addresses, is this a, just a privacy issue? but has no impact on the ability of someone to steal my Bitcoin? This is a good question. And I think that this, this is something that you need to understand. This is important. So with your public key saying that if somebody has your public key, is it just a privacy concern or can they possibly steal your Bitcoin? If somebody has your public key, so let's say that you... Let's say that you're, you sold some security cameras to somebody and you gave them your receive address. They now have your receive address. They can go into mempool, copy and paste that into the top there, the Explorer, 
and they can see your balance. They can see every transaction you've done within that wallet, just from your public key. They cannot do it. They cannot steal your Bitcoin. They cannot gain access to your wallet with your public key. But it is definitely something to consider if you're somebody who's going to be selling Bitcoin or spending Bitcoin or, or receiving Bitcoin. Anytime somebody has your public address, they can see your balance and they can see every single transaction you've ever done with that public key. And the way I like to think about this from a very simple, I guess, analogy would be it's the same as your house address. So if you wanted to mail me a nice letter, dear Jor, if you wanted to send me a nice handwritten letter, I would give you my mailing address. This is like the public key that you receive Bitcoin into. So it's the same kind of thing. I could give that out to people. A whole bunch of people have my mailing address, but they can't come into my house. And the key to my safe or the code to my safe would be like the private key to my wallet. So I would never give somebody the key to my house or the key to my safe, but I would share my mailing address with them. So that's, the, I think, the best way to look at the public versus private keys with Bitcoin. With your safe, you're not going to give it to somebody. With your house key, you're not going to give it to somebody. And with your with your private key, you're definitely not going to give it to somebody. That would be the only distinction there, is that I might give my house key to my mom if she wants to look after the house sometime, and then she'd give it back to me. I cannot give my private key to anybody with Bitcoin. I can never give my 12 words to anybody under any sort of circumstances, like we mentioned. Whether somebody's trying to help you online, whether you're in a, some sort of session with somebody and they're asking for your, pub, your private key, and especially you never enter it into random websites. So that's, uh, that's just good practice is never, ever give somebody your private key. Because when you do, they own your Bitcoin. Bitcoin only, don't shitcoin is bad for you. <laughs> Crypto Ethan says, just like you can see people's transaction history on Venmo. Oh, I didn't know that. We don't have Venmo here on in Canada. Bitcoin transactions can't be set to private. Correct. Justine says, is it best practice to get a laptop exclusive for storing Bitcoin along with a cold card? <clears throat> so this is this is my thoughts. And somebody actually just asked me this last week. Should they be getting their own laptop specifically storing Bitcoin if they also have a cold card? And this is my this is how I would answer that question. <laughs> I don't think that you need it. Kind of the purpose of the cold card is that you're never actually connecting it to your laptop. You have a micro SD card, you put it into your laptop. I guess you save a file on there, but it's a different kind of connection. You can see the files on your micro SD. You open it up, you can see your file in there. So you don't actually ever connect it to your laptop. So what I would say is that if you are somebody who has if you're very comfortable in life, if you have the money to be spending on a new laptop, specifically for crypto, I or for for Bitcoin, I would. If you're somebody who doesn't have much access to capital, I would probably put that into Bitcoin instead. So if you had a thousand bucks, you're looking to buy a Bitcoin laptop to pair with your cold card, I would probably just buy a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. That's just my opinion. And I've never heard anything arguing that. I've never heard somebody say, you have a cold card, but then you also need a laptop. One thing I would say is that I do think that if you did have a laptop exclusive to Bitcoin, it's probably preferred. It's probably like a little bit more secure, but I just don't know if it's worth spending that kind of money. I would rather just buy Bitcoin with it. If you got a cold card, you got the cold card set up properly, which we're going to be talking about here in a second. You're probably you're probably pretty good. Litecoin only says I'm a Bitcoin and a Litecoin maxi. Your name's kind of confusing then. <laughs> but no, I get it. Not a Nakamoto standard. I get it. Lite Litecoin and Bitcoin are very similar. And I do think there will be use for Litecoin by certain countries, certain groups. 
in the future. Uh, I would separate your Bitcoin from any alts you plan to store. Cold card, Blockstream, Jade. Yep, agreed with that. Cold card, Blockstream, Jade for Bitcoin. Trezor for any altcoins. Strongly agree with that. This is another great point from Jose. One strategy is using an old iPhone as a Bitcoin only phone. I do think that this is something that you could put. So something to consider here. Oh, Bitcoin just hit 68,000 bucks. Nice. Something I would consider here is, I know we're kind of all over the map right now, but that's okay. That's what the Q&As are. But one thing I would consider is get a cold card, put 95% of your Bitcoin onto that cold card with a passphrase. And then you could have other things scattered around like an old phone, download a moon wallet on there or a Phoenix wallet on an old iPhone and put some Bitcoin on there. I just like having a few different uh, reservoirs, I guess you'd say, in case something were to ever happen to it. You know, I, I never want to be in a position where 100% of my Bitcoin is in one wallet with one UTXO. I just think that you expose yourself to so much risk with that. So even if something did happen and you lost that Bitcoin, you can still have, you know, five or six different wallets kind of distributed with a decent amount of Bitcoin on there. So that is a great strategy. If you're connecting, if you're connecting it to Wi-Fi only, uh, that adds another layer of uh, security as well. If you're not using a SIM card, it, it takes away the ability for somebody else to get access to your SIM card. So, as long so the, the second part of that is as long as my seat is protected in cold storage on a cold card and has never touched the internet camera or anything digital, my Bitcoin should be safe. Yes, even if somebody has your public address, they cannot access your Bitcoin with it. Zero way to do it. So the third question here, this is a pretty good one. We got the whole episode pretty much talking about this email. So in Sparrow Wallet, I've noticed in the settings section that there's a section called XPub, ZPub. I've never, I've never been able to make any sense of the XPub displayed. It doesn't agree to the XPub on the cold card. Any thoughts? So XPub. People hear that word or that term and zone out, just kind of like when they hear hash rate, zone out. So XPUB is essentially like a newer upgrade to Bitcoin. I think it's BIP32. So BIP stands for Bitcoin Improvement Possibilities. I don't know. It's different ways to improve Bitcoin that everybody agrees on and everybody running a node agrees on. So I think it's BIP32. And so historically, this is kind of where we'll start. Historically, I believe if you had a Bitcoin address, that was your Bitcoin address. If you had that, that's, say you had a spare wallet in the old days and you had one address on there. If somebody sent you Bitcoin, you couldn't just generate a new address on there. You had to have a wallet, one wallet for every address. I believe that's how it was. But with this BIP32, it's made an improvement to Bitcoin. So an XPUB is essentially like the top of the tree, I guess you'd say. And from that, all the different addresses can be formed. So if you look at your Sparrow wallet, there's one XPUB. And that XPUB generates all the different receive addresses within that Sparrow wallet. So even though you could give somebody one receive address to send you Bitcoin, and then you give somebody else a different receive address to send you Bitcoin, as long as those are both from the same XPUB within Sparrow, it's all going to show up within your Sparrow wallet. So it was a improvement to Bitcoin. I think that that's a huge improvement. So you can you can store all your Bitcoin in the same wallet while improving your privacy without having to send uh, everybody the exact same receive address. So that's pretty cool. One thing to keep in mind there is that if somebody does have your XPUB, if they happen to get a hold of your XPUB, they can see every single receive address generated from that XPUB. So like I said, you don't really have to understand it. I don't think it's too relevant right now. If you set up your own Sparrow wallet on the settings page, you can see your XPUB. You can flip it back and forth to your ZPUB, which we'll talk about in just a sec here. But from that XPUB, that's what generates all of those receive addresses within the Sparrow wallet. 
So it's just a Bitcoin improvement that happened through the years. And I think that it is very good thing. And obviously everybody agreed to that if they passed the, the BIP. So, and then he says, uh, the last question here is what is the difference between an X pub and a Z pub? So kind of my thoughts on this, or I, I honestly didn't know myself, so I had to look up this one, but it's basically the exact same thing. Z pub, X pub, it's the same, except it has a different address type. So if you look at Sparrow, I'm going to open mine up here. I'm not going to bring it onto screen, but uh, let's see if we can get her going. I did a bit of playing around with it this morning just to see if there was a difference in the X pub versus Z pub. Hold on, hold on. So when you set up a new wallet, you're going to be presented with the policy type, single signature, or multi-signature. So that's the kind of setup that you have. And if you do decide to go multi-signature, from there you can decide how many signatures are required. So let's say you got three people in your multi-signature setup. You can set it to be two out of three people need to sign that transaction before it's confirmed or before it's broadcast. So the next part is the script type. So there's four options there. There's the legacy, there's the nested SegWit, and there's the native SegWit. So I think what everybody's most familiar with, this is the only thing that I use, is the native SegWit. I think if you're using the nested SegWit, that's what the ZPub would be for. That's what you need the ZPub for. It's just another, it's a different address type, it says. So the P2SH, I, I hate getting too technical on here because I'm I'm not an expert and I think that you just lose people talking like that, but you can explore this yourself. If you want to go into Spare Wallet, check this stuff out, you can. And so you can see there on the settings, you can see the key stores. It says the BIP, the master fingerprint, and then the XPUB, ZPUB, and you can flip those back and forth. So I don't think it's very relevant for most people to really understand this. If you stick to na native SegWit for your wallet, you don't really need to know the difference between XPUB and ZPUB. So that's kind of my thoughts on it there. Okay. Yes, some good points in the chat here. We're going to go through these quickly. Bitcoin improvement proposal. Thank you, Jose. Also, this is really important. Don't repeat your seed phrase out loud. Mics on your phone could pick it up. And one thing I would say on that is that if you are somebody who's, you know, you have your spare wallet, you're writing down your backup phrase, don't write it down in view of the camera. Be as paranoid as possible with this stuff. Because the chances of somebody actually gaining access to your wallet from that are very, very, very slim but they're not zero. So just be as paranoid as you can. Also, TJ, per the name, it means procrastinator in Hindu, which is what I was at one point. Oh, I got you, your name. I tried to pick a name in the late 90s and the spam email bots couldn't easily pick up. That's fair. It's a good call. So what is your first name if you don't mind sharing? Or don't, whatever. It's the internet, so people like being private. Good morning, Daniel. Yeah, ZPubs are, it's basically the exact same as an XPub. And if you actually go into Sparrow, it shows your XPub and you can use the two little arrows there back and forth and it swaps it from XPub to ZPub. So they're both within the same wallet. I think that the ZPub is just specific to some script. Anyways, there you go. Steve, there we go. Good to, good to meet you, essentially. We've known each other for quite a while via the YouTube chats, but glad you could be here today. Rock and roll. I love passphrases. That's what we're going to be talking about right now. So shout out there. My pal Lone Star sent in those great questions. I think pretty helpful for people, for, for me, for sure. Like I said, this is something that I'm just learning myself. And so being able to explore it a little bit further, talk about, I think it kind of helps everybody. Oh, uh, we got a we got a dog that needs to pee by the sound of the things here. So we're gonna have to keep this short. So the last question here was from uh, a new creature on YouTube. 
And the question is, let's say somebody has your seed phrase. Doesn't a passphrase stop them from stealing Bitcoin? So if somebody does get access to your 12 words, doesn't a passphrase stop them from stealing it? Yes. But you have to keep in mind here that the original wallet, your 12 words, if you add a passphrase to that wallet, that becomes a totally different wallet. And there is a lot of strategy there. One thing I would say is if you are somebody who wants to take this stuff seriously and you don't have a multi-signature set up for your Bitcoin, strongly consider the passphrase. And we did a show last week on living in the future tier, talking about passphrases and how you can set up your own decoy wallet. I don't talk about it on YouTube because the more information that's out there, the more they're going to have if somebody did get access to your cold card and, and knows about this stuff. So it, it's, a, it's a very good way to add another layer of security to your cold card. If you want to check that video out in the description, living in the future tier, Patreon, you can do a seven day free trial. If you do nothing else except for a look at that video, last week we talked about the passphrase, how to do it, the importance of it, and uh, and how you can decoy somebody into that. So if you have a passphrase, it sets up a new wallet, but if they have your 12 words, you can give them those 12 words. They're going to see a small balance of Bitcoin in there, but they don't even know that you have the additional wallet in the background there. So I hope that makes sense. Sorry, it's a little bit scrambly right now. The dog needs to pee and I really don't need to be cleaning up pee this morning. So we're going to leave it there. I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate the comments. Sorry for the scramble here at the end, but it's just part of life. So have yourselves a great day and we'll see you right back here first thing tomorrow. Check out the living in the future if you are somebody who has a cold card and wants to take this stuff seriously. That's what we're doing there. So you can get a trial. If you don't like it, you can cancel it if you want to stick around. We're, we're, we're doing some pretty cool stuff over there. So anyways, good to see you. I appreciate you all. And uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Tomorrow morning to be specific. Bye-bye.